Jai Radham Bhadava Kunjabi Hari 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 Jai Gopi Danavalaba Gary Vara Tahi Gary Gopi Danavalaba Gary Vara Tahi Gopi Sodanandana Raja Dana Hanjaya Sodanandana Raja Dana Hanjaya Jamunatira Hazana Yahoo. Jamunatira Hazan, Jahi Jamunatira Head higher heart, Ham Hat of Han, Kunjavi Head higher heart, Ham Hat of Han, Kunjavi Head higher, go be done of all above. Gary It is so an unhana, Raja Dana Hanja. Jumunatirahavad <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari, 
राम 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 हरि हरे हरे कृष्णा हरि 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्ण कृष्ण गौर हे हम हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे हम कृष्ण कृष्ण The tiger. Hey, Rama. Hey, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hey, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna. Yes, the Krishna Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari. Nithai Gaur Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Nithai Gaur Hari Bhav Hari Bhav. Nithai Gaur Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Gaur Hari Bhav 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 Sri Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Jai Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 9, Chapter 3. I believe they didn't do verse number 12 yet, so they skipped over 12 because 12 doesn't have a purport. So we'll do the translation or the Sanskrit for 13, and then we'll go back and read a few of the verses here. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Badham ityu chatur vipram Abhinandya bishaktamo Nirmajatam bhavan asmin Radde siddha vinirmite Bhadamityu chatur vipram Abhananya bishaktamo Nirmijatam bhavan asmin Radhe siddha vinirmite
Mm. Ladies? <laughs> Badam. Yes, we shall act. <laughs> Iti. Thus. Uchatu. They both replied, accepting the proposal of Chaivana. Vipram. Unto the Brahmana. Chaivana Muni. Abhinandya. Congratulating him. Vishaktamo. The two great physicians, the Aswini Kumaras. Nirmajatam. Just dive. Bhavan. Yourself. Asmin. In this. Rade. Lake. Siddha Vinirmite, which is specially meant for all kinds of perfection. So what is happening here is that Chaivan Muni uh, was offended because he had taken the form of a little worm and was in a hole and he was pierced by one personality. And then he realized after he had offended him, and Chaiva Muni was quite disturbed what happened. So in order to pacify Chaiva Muni, he gave him his beautiful young daughter, Sukanya. <laughs> now Chaiva Muni is a very old, wrinkled up sadhu. <laughs> and he has this beautiful young wife. And he she's very knows that he gets angry quite easy. <laughs> So she's very careful in how she deals with him. So this is where we are. Now what happens is the Ashwini Kamaras happen to come onto the scene and they are the, well, we the transcendental physicians. So now they're instructing uh, Chaivan Muni and they say, of course I'll read the verse number 12. Chaivan Muni said, Although you are ineligible to drink the Soma Rasas in sacrifice, I promise to give you a full pot of it, kindly arranged beauty and youth for me, because they are attractive to young women. Hmm. So he wants to satisfy his wife and become young again. Okay. The great physicians, the Aswini Kumaras, very gladly accepted Chaivani Muni's proposal. <clears throat> They told the Brahmana, just dive into this lake of successful life. One who bathes in this lake has his desires fulfilled. After saying this, the Aswini Kumars caught hold of Chaivan Muni, who was, in, who was an old diseased invalid with loose skin, white hair, and veins all over his body. All three of them entered the lake. Imagine having a husband like that, huh? Wow. <laughs> It's exciting, right? <laughs> Purport. Chaivan Muni was so old that he could not enter the lake alone. Thus they asked when he caught hold of his body and the three of them entered the lake. Verse 15. Thereafter the three men with very beautiful bodily features emerged from the lake. They were nicely dressed and decorated with earrings and garlands of lotuses. All of them were of the same standard of beauty. Hmm. This lake is an, uh, the lake's the, the, what they call it, the fountain of youth. <laughs> you know, there was a story in America, Ponce de Leon. He was a famous Spanish traveler. And he came to America and then he discovered, well, not discovered, he took over. <laughs> one part of America, which is now the area of Florida. 
and he uh, supposedly discovered the uh, lake of youth or the elixir of youth. If you bathe in this some lake there and somewhere in Florida, you become young again. So, <laughs> so it's even got something contemporary in it, huh? Then the next verse, verse sixteen, the chaste and very beautiful Sukunya could not distinguish her husband from the two Aswini Kumaras, for they were equally beautiful. Not understanding who her real husband was, she took shelter of the Aswini Kumaras. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Sukanya could have selected any one of them as her husband, for for one could not distinguish among them because she, for one could not distinguish among them, but because she was chaste, she took shelter of the Aswini Kumaras so that they could inform her who her actual husband was. A chaste woman will never accept any man other than her husband, even if there is even if there be someone equally as handsome and as qualified. Omagyan Timirandasya. Kirajana Salakaya Chaksun Militamyena Tasma Shri Gudavena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasdaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachari Nani Vasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Panchakopa Darubhischa Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha Paditanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sri Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. Interesting little pastime here. And we're hearing about a woman who is chaste. Um, although, as it says here, all of the men that came out were equally as handsome and qualified and decorated same, and she could not distinguish who was her real husband. She looked to take shelter of the Aswini Kumaras because she wanted actually to come back to her real husband. And then here, the chastity of a woman is being glorified. The power of a woman is her chastity. And so we have the example of Gandhari in the scriptures. Gandhari was the wife of Dhritarashtra. And Dhritarashtra was a blind king. He was blind in two ways. One, physically blind. And two, he, was, he had limited sight on understanding what is truth. And he was always being instructed by his uh, younger brother Vidura, who was always concerned about his older brother. But Dhritarashtra had a very difficult time accepting what Vidura said, but Vidura never gave up on him. And finally, at the end, Vidura saved him. But he was blind physically, and he had, his wife was Gandhari. Now, Gandhari, not wanting to be in a better position than her husband, she used to wear a blindfold over her eyes just to uh, not be in a superior position to her husband. She wanted to maintain that dutiful position of servant of her husband. And uh, therefore, and of course, she was very powerful. She was so powerful that her son, Diodana, Diodana, when uh, she wanted to uh, make her son Diodana invincible. And uh, she said to her son, you come to mo me tomorrow and you come without any clothes on and I will see your body. And the idea is that she, if she takes her for blindfolds and sees his body, his body will become like iron, like steel. And then he could not be killed. And so he agreed. He wanted that benediction. So that was his mother. So he's walking along and he's naked. <laughs> and then Krishna happens to see him and says, 
uh, where are you going? <laughs> and he says, I'm going to see my mother. Well, no clothes on? That's not right. You should put some loincloth on. So somehow Krishna was convincing and he put a loincloth on. So when he came before his mother, she took the blindfold off and as she could see, her plan was foiled. Krishna had foiled their plan because he, that part of his body, his, his hips were vulnerable. And so when he was fighting with Bhima at the end, Bhima smashed him in the hips and broke his hips and that's how he died. Otherwise, he couldn't have been killed <laughs> because of the power of his, his mother. She was a chaste woman. So in the history of chaste ladies in the Vedic culture, Gandhari is considered one of the foremost, along with Mandodari, the wife of uh, Ravana. She was also Anasuya. Anasuya was so chaste that she even instructed the supreme goddess of fortune, Lakshmi Devi, on the principles of chastity. Lakshmi, uh, uh, not, not, yeah, she, Sita Devi was the wife of Ramchandra, and she came to Anasuya to learn more about chastity. <laughs> so Anasuya is considered to be the, the epitome of all chaste women. You can read her about her life in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, so there are many great women in, in the history, and their chastity makes them powerful. A woman's power is her chastity, her allegiance to her husband, her following religious duties very carefully, and her non-interaction with other men. A chaste woman will not even talk to other men. Of course, in our Krishna consciousness society, we're not so, you know, strict. But that is actually, uh, I know one lady, and she's in Switzerland, and she's, she won't talk to any men. She's always with her husband. And she's very, uh, yeah, you know, very, very strict in her behavior. And this makes a woman very powerful, spiritually and also materially. And um, we see the example. Sukanya here, and she, she had complete allegiance to her husband. I know her husband was just an old, wrinkled up, Sadhu, whose skin was so loose that it, they'd ha he'd have to hold up his skin because it was just sagging in different places. <laughs> it's like, I mean, he, she had a husband that was so ugly <laughs> and so old, and she was so young and beautiful. But she didn't consider that. She considered this is my husband, and therefore I should serve him as a dutiful wife should do, like that. So... This is a nice example here, and as Prabhupada says, a chaste woman will never accept any other man other than a husband, even if there is someone better than him or equal to him, like that. So uh, this is the power of chastity. So we also can use that same principle in Krishna conscious life. Chastity is one of the highest principles of a disciple. What is that chastity for a disciple? They remain very fixed on the instructions of their, their spiritual master. They always are eager to hear from their spiritual master. They're always eager to learn more from their spiritual master. They're always eager to serve their spiritual master. And they're fixed on that mood. And because they that, they actually become very advanced in devotional service. <laughs> um, we have a nice example. Of course, it's just an interesting example, wherein um, uh, one of our devotees in the Krishna Conscious Movement, Hayagriva, he, uh, he, in a dream, he dreamt one night, he saw Krishna speaking Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. And then, as the dream continued, Krishna tur turned into Srila Prabhupada, and he turned into, and Arjuna turned into him in the dream. And then the next day, he 
told Prabhupada what he has done. And Prabhupada said, yeah, this is correct. Yeah. When you hear from the, your spiritual master, you're hearing from the Supreme Personality of Godhead directly. There's no difference. <laughs> and so that a disciple takes that mood of Krishna consciousness. And when they do, they become... We can also learn from others, but when it comes to service and surrender, the spiritual master becomes the principle that the devotee keeps foremost. Like another devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I don't have any attraction for Krishna, but I'm really attracted for you, to you. <laughs> Prabhupada said, that is all right. <laughs> so yeah, and Prabhupada was saying, explaining that the pure devotee's spiritual master represents Krishna completely. Jai, Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. And in the Panchatattva, we also have the principle of Guru there. And that is Sri Nityananda Ram. He is the Adi Guru, or the original Guru. Sri Krishna Chaitanya is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, manifest and within the mood of a devotee, but he is the Supreme Lord. Nityananda is also Supreme Lord, but he takes the mood of the, the pure devotee spiritual master and serves the Lord, because Nityananda is always eager to serve uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he is the principle of Guru Tattva. And we have a Dvaita, he is Bhakti Tattva. He, is the, he represents the process of pure devotional service. And then we have Gadadhar, who is Shakti Tattva. He is the internal energy reflected as Srimati Radharani. And then we have Srivas, is the pure devotee. So the whole Panchatattva makes up the absolute truth in five principles like that. So the chastity of Nityananda to Lord Chaitanya is, what we say, perfect. And so a disciple should take shelter of Lord Nityananda and pray to Lord Nityananda, please, Lord Nityananda, fix me in the mood of complete allegiance and complete dedication in service to my spiritual master. And one who does that, they are guaranteed to go back home, back to God, and has the principle of devotional life. <laughs> so, um, and we see, but now the influence of Kali Yuga has come upon us, and we don't somehow or other understand this principle, or we can't follow it. And then we find that some devotees, after taking initiation, remain very enthusiastic. But as time goes on, they lose their enthusiasm. And because of being challenged by the material energy, or not be able to get rid of certain material desires, they don't really have much, uh, as much faith and much dedication to the spiritual master that was there before they were initiated and when they got initiated. And sometimes they even give up their vows, fail to chant 16 rounds, or even break the regulative principles. And sometimes they never even contact their spiritual masters, like the spiritual master doesn't exist. <laughs> they never write, they never talk, they never come to any programs. Even when the spiritual master is in the area, they still don't come. <laughs> I have many examples. <laughs> in Slovenia. <laughs> so, yeah, this is what it's like. And so that is unfortunate because they're only hurting themselves. <laughs> they're, they're only, they, they, they think that their material life is more important and therefore they have to put all their time, energy and uh, activities in their material life. And what will be the result? The next, they get another birth to try again, next life. <laughs> if you make your material life more important than your spiritual life, then you come back in your next life to perform it again. 
because Krishna fulfills all desires. Oh, this is more important than me and devotional service. All right, so that's what you want here. Come back again and try again. And so life after life, that mood is there. So the, the mood of a disciple is complete chastity or obedience to the spiritual master. And Prabhupada would make it even say that my spiritual master is wrong, but he's right. <laughs> spiritual master is wrong, but he's right. Um, now that's a hard one for Kali Yuga, right? <laughs> you're wrong, and you're wrong. <laughs> No, what does it mean that one does never argue with the spiritual master? If one argues with the spiritual master, that is an offense, even if the spiritual master is wrong, from the material point of view. But he's never wrong from the spiritual point of view. He might be wrong from the material point of view. But the spiritual point of view is the point of view that's important. You know, so I give you an example. Um, Prabhupada was, this was very early in the back in the early days of uh, Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada was, um, he was recording tapes of his lectures, these cassette tapes. And he was sending them to Satsarup Maharaj, who had transcribed the, 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 the tapes. So Prabhupada had transcribed or recorded a few tapes. So he put them in the package, wrapped it up, and it was meant to be sent to the post office. So he called one devotee to take it to the post office. So the devotee takes the package, he starts looking at it, and he says, Prabhupada, this package is not wrapped correctly. You should, you know, you should rewrap it. <laughs> uh, and Prabhupada said, no. Nah, it's all right, go ahead and mail it. <laughs> and the devotee, he walks away a little bit, looks at it again, he says, it's not going to go. Comes back to Prabhupada, says, Prabhupada, you know, you know, it has to be rewrapped or else it's not going to mail properly. Prabhupada said, no, it's okay, just mail it. <laughs> and so he's walking again and again. He uh, thinks, well, I think Prabhupada does, just doesn't understand, you know, because he's from India and this is America. You know? <laughs> and so he goes back to Prabhupada and again he presented. Prabhupada gets really angry, slams his fist on it. Everything I do is correct. Mail it. <laughs> so what was he teaching? Prabhupada was teaching that obedience. That was he was teaching. He was using that as an example to teach obedience to the spiritual master. Whether the package was wrapped right or not, it doesn't. It didn't really matter. That wasn't the issue. The issue was obedience to the spiritual master. And that was a good. So the devotee was okay when he brought it back to Prabhupada the first time. So he wasn't wrong in doing that. But when Prabhupada told him, no, that's okay, it's okay, when he kept coming back, there's where he made his mistake. Initially, he was using his intelligence to say, oh, all right, some correction needs to be made. That's fine, and that's allowable. And that's not... But when Prabhupada already said, no, well, it's, not, it's okay, you just mail it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Sometimes Prabhupada would have to repeat himself just to get the point across. One time Prabhupada was walking with uh, his disciples and there was one householder there. He had just newly got married. So he asked Srila Prabhupada, and then, Prabhupada, what is the first duty of a householder? Prabhupada stopped the morning walk planted his cane in the ground, turned to the disciple and said, the first duty of a householder is before you take your food every day, you go to the door and you call loudly, are there any hungry f people out there? Are there any hungry people? You call three times, any hungry people. Come. 
And so, mm, you know, then Prabhupada turned around and started walking. <laughs> and the devotee kept thinking, hmm, doesn't sound right. <laughs> so he asked again. Prabhupada was very patient. Again, he stopped and walked. He said, the first duty of the householder is well, before you take your food, you go to the door and you call out three times, are there any hungry people? Uh, and then, if no one comes, then you can take your food. Okay? So he then Prabhupada turns and walks again. So then, the devotee thinks, hmm. There must be another principle that's higher than that. <laughs> so he asks again. Prabhupada puts his cane in the ground. This Prabhupada remained completely calm. He didn't get disturbed. He said, well, before you take your food, you go to the door and you call three times. Are there any hungry people? And no one comes and you can take prasad. <laughs> and Prabhupada went on and that was the end of it. <laughs> Prabhupada was very patient with this one. So he was teaching that household life means to understand that it's not your house. It belongs to Krishna. You're simply living there. And a householder has to be charitable. And one of the ways to show charity is to feed others. So there is an injunction in the scriptures that a householder has to feed every day at least one living entity other than their family members with prasadam. That means the ants in the room, <laughs> the mouse that's running in and out of the hole, <laughs> the cat that comes by, the dog that's barking outside, or just some other living human being. <laughs> in other words, it's important that householders don't become what they call the grihamedi or stingy. They have to understand that janasamoham yamahamam eti, that everything belongs to the Supreme Lord. I am simply his servant. Therefore, it's my duty in household life to also give charity to others. And one of the best ways, of course, there's many ways, but the best way is to distribute Krishna prasadam like that. And those of you who can stick around to cl the end of class, I'm, I'm not a householder, but I'm, we, we got some maha here. There's a, there's a lot, there's a nice variety too. You can also choose whatever kind you like. <laughs> So there's always benefit of going to Bhagavatam class. <laughs> and then at the end of the class, some will ask you, what was that class about? Well, the prasad was good. <laughs> so yeah, this is... So again, back to that point of chastity. Chastity is such a... With women, towards their husband, ultimately. It says a woman should never be independent. When she's young, she should be under the care of her father. When she's married, she's under the care of her uh, husband. And when she's old, she's under the care of her grown-up sons. Or if, if there's no grown-up sons, she takes shelter of the temple, like that. But in all cases like that, because just like a father's duty is to get his daughter married. If he doesn't arrange for his daughter to get married, he is sinful. He gets sinful reactions for that. So it's the duty of the father to make sure that the daughter, before he leaves the world, has a proper husband. And when a father does that, and then he, his duty as a father towards his daughter is complete. He's so happy. And it says that he sees his son-in-law as a worshipable object. And on the marriage, he pays obeisances to his son-in-law. Because son-in-law has done him a great service by accepting his daughter as, her, 
as his husband, as his wife, and relieving the uh, uh, father from the duty, and therefore the father can now be peaceful. <laughs> yeah, that's Vedic culture. And it applies across the board, even though we're not in Vedic culture here, we're practicing the uh, principles of Vedic culture like that. Mm -hmm. And I've seen many fathers, especially of Indian fathers who have daughters, and they can't find a husband for their daughter, and they're just like, mm, really quite upset. They're disturbed trying to find a husband for their daughter. But when they do, it's like ecstasy. <laughs> they're very happy, yeah. Yeah, so here's another example of responsibility in chastity, chastity to the family for the husband, like that. A, a, a wife should never argue with her husband. If she wants to correct her husband, she should do it without arguing with him or uh, speaking different than he is. The duty of a wife is to always obey her husband, and if there's some disagreement with that husband, she can use her feminine charm and her intelligence to correct her husband in a sweet way, and he doesn't even know he's being corrected. <laughs> and the ladies know how to do it, so I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> but if they argue, that will break the marriage. Yeah. yeah, a husband doesn't want a wife that argues with him all the time and because it just destroys the marriage. I've, I've talked to many ladies and one lady she told me, my husband used to tell me, what you're saying to me is right, but I can't do it because you're saying it. So a husband doesn't like to be told what to do with it by his wife, but she can tell him what to do in a way that he gets the message without telling him. <laughs> and that when that's called women's charm, they know how to do that. It may take a little more time, but the message will keep the relationship nice, yeah, yeah, like that. So these are some principles to keep good, strong marriages. And that's that's important, like that, because men have big egos, and the women have to satisfy that ego in such a way that it doesn't disturb the relationship, like that. And the man should also be expert at taking care of his wife. He should give her flowers, nice food, nice clothing, nice jewelry. I mean, that's another duty of, that's in the scriptures. The husband has to give his wife, from time to time, she should have nice clothes. Even if you're poor, you still have to do it. <laughs> nice flowers for her birthday or for some occasion. Or um, nice food, that's also mentioned. And jewelry also, women like jewelry. Yeah. So these are, these are principles that keep the relationship nice. It's not like, okay, everything is nice before we get married and then we're in love, but then when we get married, then it's, okay, it's business as usual. <laughs> no, it should, the love between husband and wife should increase and in as the marriage continues. And there's ways for that to increase how the women treat the men and how the husband uh, treats the wife, so it's very important. And keeping Krishna in the center, that's the principle, of course. Okay, so I'll stop there. So, any questions about chastity or just in general? Yes, uh, Mukunda Madhava. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare. You sp you spoke about uh, chastity, and uh, how. Uh, what are the uh, some guidelines for uh, uh, relationships between uh, guru disciple prabhus and uh, matajis in the temple? Oh, like, relationships. Uh, yeah, yeah. Prabhupada says, 
the men should always refer to the woman as mother and the women should see the men as son. <laughs> Prabhupada also said that. That way it keeps it off the, the what we call the sensual platform. Your mother is an object of respect and honor. We, we, we respect the women, we honor them. We don't just see them as just ladies. We see them as somebody who is actually respectable. And we use that term mataji, mother, like that. Of course, sometimes Western ladies, because they're not accustomed to that, they feel uncomfortable when they're called like that. But even if you don't call, you should still use, you used to be very respectful and uh, not overly friendly. <laughs> The devotee is friendly by nature, that's the devotee's nature, but to get too much into the friendly relationships with ladies causes a disturbance in the mind, both for the lady and for the men. <laughs> yeah, and then Krishna consciousness is lost at that point. So yeah, like that. There are many things you can do like that. Well, Western society is, there's no culture there, so we're trying to learn what is actual culture, culture from Krishna consciousness. So to unlearn is not so easy because the way we're brought up in the Western society is that we don't have any, any etiquette, proper etiquette like that. You know, in India, the boys and girls in the, would always be in separate classes, in the girls' class and the boys' class. Or even now, even if they don't have separate classes, the girls sit in one place in the classroom and the boys sit in the other side, just like we do in the temple here, like that. The men shouldn't sit on the women's side, and the men and the women shouldn't sit on the men's side. That's happening now. <laughs> yeah, that's the real yeah. We should keep that etiquette because it says man is like butter and woman is like fire. <laughs> and if you put butter and fire together, what happens? You get melting. <laughs> that's. <laughs> So yeah, so we have to respect that etiquette like that. And then there's many scriptures, I mean the third canto is full of statements about the proper etiquette between men and women like that. It says that, you know, usually a brahmachari lives with the guru and the guru's wife sometimes takes care of the brahmachari when the boy is living at the house of the guru. But if the guru's wife is young, then the, the, the disciple should not take service from his guru's wife like that. Well, that's, in, that's in Bhagavatam also. So yeah, so there's a lot of etiquette that we should. But if you keep a mood of respect, and that's the most important, then you, you don't fall down to the sensual aspect like that so much. We, uh, the whole principle of Krishna consciousness is to respect each other. <laughs> we respect, we respect even respect the non-devotees because Krishna is in the heart of the non-devotees also. So we give them due respect, but we don't associate it with, of course. <laughs> that respect is given from a distance. <laughs> but we should be very aware that, um, you know, material energy is very precarious in any... I've seen just a little bit of a mistake in that kind of association and it changes everything. <laughs> Women and men should not be in the kitchen together, cooking together. Women and that's because well, that's that's where marriages start in the kitchen and on the altar. <laughs> Happens all the time, <laughs> especially on the altar. <laughs> 
So you're thinking, huh, here's a good way to get married, huh? <laughs> well, that's where romance starts, in the kitchen or in the, in the, on the altar. So if you can avoid that, then, then, yeah, because it's very, the service is very intimate in that, in these two areas of service, you know. I've been around a long time. I've seen all of it <laughs> from a distance. <laughs> you know, this is the history of our movement. <laughs> yeah. And don't think you're ever safe. Well, yeah, I'm so fixed up. I'm never going to, you know. Famous last words. <laughs> hmm. And the Bhagavatam in the second, first canto, second chapter, verse number 17, if you read the purport, Prabhupada said that even the great stalwart devotees, because if they're not careful in the association of two things, money and the opposite sex, we have so many examples of many of them falling down from their Krishna consciousness because of money and opposite. I know some, some sannyasis don't handle any money at all. If they, people give them money, they give it to their senior disciples and they manage all their affairs. They don't touch money. Money and you know, the opposite sex are the two causes of fall down in devotional service. For brahmacharis, that is. <laughs> but even in household life, one should not think, well, I'm married and I can become loose with my association with mine. There should be, that respect should also be there and also proper etiquette too. Another thing I don't like and that our society doesn't seem to understand is that sometimes someone has to talk to a lady and give some instruction. So they choose a grihasta man who's not married to that lady to talk to her because he's a grihasta so he, he can talk to ladies. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's another flaw in Krishna consciousness. No, then it has to be if it has to be done, it should be done by those who have that service. And not just any grihasta, because oh, he's married, he can talk to women now. Yeah, I've also seen people give up their spouse and go with another person because of wrong association with someone else. Yeah, I've seen that happen so many times. I've seen almost people kill. I've seen the man, the, the wife gets attracted to another man and the husband wants to kill the guy. It almost happened, I saw it one time. The devotee was waiting at the door for, the, for this guy who stole his wife and he had a brick in his hand, he was gonna smash him. Fortunately, he didn't come that day. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Another man, he told me and somebody stole his wife and he picked up a gun. He was going to find him. But then he realized this wasn't going to be the best thing. Uh, he was angry. So yeah, it's, it can cause, you know, quite... So we should be very careful in association because... And if we give, if we keep respect amongst each other, then there won't be any sensual mm -hmm. moods really developing. It's the mood of respect. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. Okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Maharaj Hare Krishna. Um, I know when we uh, start to find birth to get married, uh, we should consider authority of Jyotish, authority of Guru, or authority of person who is uh, uh, yeah. uh, 
who knows who, both who people? Knows? So according to that, uh, what uh, what kind of authority uh, consider a father uh, according in previous uh, times to to find match for daughter? Well, what should the father do? Well, he can use any one of those three, <clears throat> but the most hmm, the most important, of course, in Vedic culture, the the husband or the father would always look for similar statuses in life. In other words, same economic status, same educational status, like that. Same nice bridge. The husband should be about five years older than the wife. That's ideal, four to five years older, like that. Because women mature faster than men. So a boy of 16 and a girl of 16 is like a mother to a son. <laughs> women are more, they mature faster in life. Guys never grow up, you know. <laughs> and still trying to run around the world, trying to find the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi. <laughs> <laughs> and women have more to lose, therefore they're very careful. <laughs> so, but men want to just, you know, jump around here and there like monkeys. <laughs> Not devotee men, this is just in general. <laughs> but um, the most important principle of evaluation is to consult people who know both the girl and the boy well. Even that's better than Jyotish. Mm -hmm. Jyotish should be considered, but a person who knows both of them will say, you know, a well-wisher, not just anybody. Yes, this relationship looks good. <laughs> and sometimes you can see automatically that it's not going to work. <laughs> or if it does work, it's going to be very difficult for them because their personalities are different. So it says when you, you look for two things, nature and, uh, what's the other? Nature and lifestyle or likings. The boy and girl has, should have similar likings in life and their natures should complement each other. In other words, you know, if you get a Kshatriya nature and a Brahma nature together, then you find it's going to be a little rough riding right there. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, those natures should be, yeah, similar and the likings are just like sometimes ladies marry men who are not devotees and then it becomes really hard for them to practice your Krishna consciousness. So they should avoid that also. So we should find people who have similar likings and similar natures. That's from Bhagavatam also. So. And Jyotis helps in that area, but people who know you can really, they're good. People who know both of you can say, yes, this looks good. Mm -hmm. Because you see, what is the divorce rate in the world? It's high, it's more than 50%. At one time it was 70% in America. And in and in ISKCON, it was almost 90%. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> Some people say, well, arranged marriages don't work. Yes. And unarranged marriages don't work. Yes. <laughs> so what's better, arranged or unarranged? Usually, with the guidance of superior persons, 
something that is arranged means you get support from others. And you can use that advice and support to help make a decision. And you see, nowadays it's really bad. I know so many girls that are over 30 years old and they're not married. And it's just like, that's sad. And they're, they want a husband, but doesn't, somehow it's not happening for whatever reason. Even there is like, in Krishna consciousness in London, there's one girl, she's my god sister, you know. And she does uh, marriage connections. People put their name in, and this is good. And then she tries to find a boy and a girl to match up. And she always tells me, I can't find anybody. They, nobody wants to get married. <laughs> they come looking for a husband, and then when I match him up, they don't like it. <laughs> so, she says it's very difficult nowadays. Very difficult. The girls are extra careful nowadays because they can see many of their friends have been burnt by marriages, wrong marriages, so they don't want to make the same mistake like that. A woman is looking for three things in a husband. Affection, protection, and material security. So you better have some money. <laughs> These three things. Women's are looking for affection, protection, and material security. And a man is looking for Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. <laughs> He's waiting for that beautiful lady to descend on the flower airplane riding on the swan. And then he, there's my wife. Yeah, I finally found her. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's what men are always looking for, that most beautiful girl to descend into his life. And the women are just looking for uh, someone who can be affectionate, who is, uh, can give security in life, and at the same time can also give protection. <laughs> if you follow that, I mean, for those of you who want to learn more, there's one beautiful book, it's called the four, four Duties of Household Life, I think it's called. It's by the same lady I mentioned. Her name is Jagad, Jagadishwari. She's from. And if you don't want to read the book, the book is great. Uh, I took notes on the book. I have about 50 pages of notes based on this book, which I use to give seminars on this topic. So if anybody wants my notes, it might be also helpful like that. Mm -hmm. So when we, uh, when we understand all of these things, then, because uh, marriage is very, very important. It's not like you go out and buy a car or you can trade in your car. It's almost like buying a house. When you buy a house, you're going to really shop around until you Make sure you get that house that is the one you really feel happy with, comfortable with. Same with husband and wife. It's not something that you just... So you should be entered into with great intelligence and not simply physical attraction. Because physical attraction, and this is a statistics, physical attraction wears off in about two years. And then there has to be something else there to keep the relationship going. Of course, in devotional service, we keep religious principles foremost. So devotees have that extra principle. We call it the third partner. That's called Krishna. <laughs> he makes the marriage work. <laughs> if we keep Krishna in the center like that. And keeping Krishna in the center means keeping religious principles in the center. That's what it really means. So, like that. so each of the ashrams has principles by which governs the activities of the ashram. So, especially grihastha life. There's many duties, responsibilities, restrictions. 
If we follow them carefully, then the relationship will develop. And I know some devotees in our movement that have been married for 50 years. And uh, they were arranged marriages too. And they have, they have successfully followed that religious principle. Because they successfully followed those religious principles, the marriage grew better and better and better like that. Okay, so, any other questions? No? If we have time, a uh, question about the disciple, can I ask? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, it was issue between devotees that uh, when devotee become mature in Krishna consciousness and they like to progress more, uh, Prabhupada's books uh, talks about uh, basic things, so devotees should read more. No, uh, no you uh, haven't read Prabhupada's books then if you say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's a bogus question. Bhakti Charu Swami gave a seminar exp showing that everything you need and more is in Prabhupada's books. He pointed it out in a very systematic and a very philosophical way. It's all there in Prabhupada's books. Read Chaitanya Charitamrita. <laughs> all rasa, all details, all we Everything's need. Everything's there. Need. Everything's there. Enough to go back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> Everything is there. And listen to his lectures and he kind of punctuates what's in his books by his lectures. He adds extra in his lectures. But his books are the foundation for everything. The lectures are second, but the books are first. Everything's there in the books. If someone says that, that means they either don't understand Prabhupada's books or they haven't read them, either one, if somebody's speaking like that. That devotees like to read uh, uh, Krishna Raj Goswami, uh, uh, I don't know, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, this, this, this. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Prabhupada said we can read his books. Yeah. I think about that uh, uh, books uh, from disciple succession beyond Prabhupada. I mm, think about but that. Prabhupada didn't want us to read so much Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. But he said, Bhaktivinoda, you can read. Because Bhakti Vinod Thakur has a Western flair to his presentation of Vedic culture, Vedic knowledge. And his two books that Prabhupada recommended we read, it was Jaiva Dharma and Chaitanya Shikshamrita, these two books, especially Jaiva Dharma, which has the whole science of Bhakti. So Prabhupada, yeah, gave, gave allowance, gave privilege, permission for us to read Bhakti Vinod. But he wasn't so enthusiastic to give permission to read his guru's books. Mm -hmm. Bhakti Siddhanta is a little bit more esoteric and more deeper. And uh, so he said, if you want Bhakti Siddhanta, you can get it from me. <laughs> That's generally the case. Okay, so we can stop here. Don't forget the best part of the class. Sela Prabhupada ki. Yeah. <laughs>